I have seen a lot of people who have like strong eighth house placements be able to be, you know, like crisis counselors, emergency room doctors, people who can be there to get people through. And I would say that that is a really powerfully helpful, powerfully positive manifestation of the eighth house. This podcast episode is brought to you by The Inner Circle, your place to learn astrology and community with the masters and transform your life in the process. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Astrology Hub podcast. This is a continuation of our house series. And today we are here for a deep dive into the eighth house. I'm here with astrologer and upcoming Inner Circle Astrologer Guide, Ryan Butler, who will be helping us understand all things 8th house. And in case you're hopping into the middle of this series, the house series here at the Astrology Hub podcast is dedicated to helping you understand all 12 of the houses, what they mean, what they represent in your life, how to interpret different planetary placements in the houses. And each week we're releasing a new episode focused on one of the houses taught by one of our inner circle astrologer guides and mentors. And we've gathered the most commonly asked questions about each of the houses and we're just going deep. So if you have been hanging out here with us during this series, thank you so much for joining us. I have loved hearing your feedback and I'm so happy that you're enjoying the series as much as I am and as much as we are at Astrology Hub. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ryan before we dive in. Ryan has studied classical astrological techniques with an emphasis on medieval astrology since 2009. He has lectured locally and as a part of national conferences, working to spread the techniques of medieval astrology to those who would otherwise not encounter them or may not immediately see their value. Ryan, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Super excited to to dive into this I would say probably the more interesting and more maybe fun houses for people. So this is going to be exciting to see kind of what questions or or what we're able to to help dispel for people as we approach this this particular house. Perfect. And, you know, we've we've had a few questions from the audience so far about house systems Mm -hmm. and what they mean and what they are. We are going to be doing a 13th episode. This is just... (laughs) The 13th episode is going to be with Gemini Brett on the house system. So we're going to be going deep dive. When to use one versus the other? What are the differences, the nuances? And I'm assuming since you're a medieval astrologer that you're using whole sign. No, no, no. I am. Yeah, yeah. Curveball. No, I am. I, I, I playfully describe myself as a whole sign skeptic. Some controversy there. I primarily utilize Placidus houses, but I have, I've, I've, Throughout my, you know, since 2009, I've used probably about four different house systems before just kind of being like, you know what, Plastis, that's the best. That's that's my favorite one. Okay. You know what? And I just want to say to any of you new who are like, there's all these house systems and there's all these things to learn. It's so overwhelming. Just what I've heard from most astrologers is just choose one Mm -hmm. to learn with. Just go with the one that you're working with right now. And then you will have time to explore the other ones yeah. and the nuances and the when and the why and the how. Just stick with one for now and and um, don't don't allow yourself to get too confused by all the different nuances, right? Yeah, Would you yeah. say that too, Ryan? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's one of those things where it's like people or students will eventually come and they'll be like, which house system should I use? And right. to me, that's kind of just be like, well, what breakfast cereal <laughs> do you want? Like, what are you after in a house system? And yeah. so like that question is such a weird question to be asked. It's like, well, what are the houses to you? Like, let's just start there. And, you know, if that doesn't, if that's a question that sounds like gibberish to you, then that's fine. You know, we can come back to that later. But yeah, just pick one thing, get comfortable with it. And then you can always circle back around to figuring out what, what fits your style best later on. I remember when I first came into astrology, it felt a little bit like the diet debate, like, should hmm. you be keto? Should you be paleo? Should you do low calorie? Should you do low fat? It's It was so overwhelming to hear all the different hmm. opinions. So I love what you're saying, Ryan, and I totally concur. Just pick one for now, go with it. And the thing about learning astrology is that more and more gets revealed to you as you're ready and as, yeah. you know, as you're going to be able to absorb it. So just, it, I, I continually remind people, just relax and yeah. enjoy the process of learning. Yeah, I think relax is a good thing to say because ultimately... Whatever house system you use really isn't that important. Mm. So like, mm. 
it's not that serious. Yeah. But okay, people, good. but people make it to that way. So I see where a lot of the, I see where the stress comes from, but it's like, it's not that it's fine. <laughs> okay. You haven't, awesome. you haven't, you haven't ruined it. You haven't shot yourself in the foot fry by using whatever has system. It's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Perfect. All right. So with all of that said, talk about the ape house. What does it mean? What does it represent? Just give us that like high, high level overview of the eighth house. Ooh, okay. So the eighth house is one that I think tends to be a lot of fun, not because the eighth house itself is fun, but because there's a lot of differing viewpoints throughout kind of like comparing the sort of more historical aspect of the eighth house to a little bit more of like a, a sort of 20th century reinterpretation of it. And so it's one of those houses that gets talked about a lot because people are kind of coming at it from different ways. So that's the fun part. I think the controversy of it is the fun part, not the house itself. So the eighth house, all houses really can be sort of divided into kind of subcategories. And these subcategories sort of come together to provide a better picture of what the house is, of, of what that specific house does. So the eighth house specifically is a house that historically we refer to as a dark house because it is a house that does not usually typically line up with a it does not typically have or share a strong aspect with the ascendant. So like the eighth, the sixth, the second and the twelfth are all houses that are considered dark because they lack this really strong and forward or direct connection with the ascendant, which represents the point of light emerging into the world. Like that's the point of that's where the sun rises. So all these houses that kind of don't have that strong geometrical relationship with this point kind of dwell in darkness a little bit. So being a dark house, all these houses that are dark, not just the eighth house, they tend to represent things that are a little bit more hidden, a little bit more tucked away, things that maybe we don't want to talk about, or maybe things that we ourselves are kind of blind to. And of course, unfortunately, they can also represent things that are subject subjectively negative experiences. So that's not that's not super fun, but that's just that's just part of it. And the eighth house isn't alone in that other houses share that as well. The eighth house also is a house that is situated above the horizon and houses that are above the horizon are a little bit more kind of solar in their emphasis. And this is more of like a, a spirit mind versus body kind of dichotomy. So like houses under the earth, the first through the sixth houses tend to be a little bit more focused on the body, whereas the houses above the earth, the sort of 12th through the seventh tend to represent the mind or the spirit or like even other people. So there's kind of like the, the my sphere and then the everything else sphere. And so the eighth house being in this solar house is a little bit more mental, spiritual than physical. And it also has a fun Greek name, which I'm probably going to mispronounce because I don't speak Greek, where its title is Epic, Epic Atafora, which means to fall into the underworld. And this is just like the, the sort of the solar journey, right? The sun rises on the ascendant and sets on the descendant. So the eighth house tends to represent that like really strong setting motion. When the sun's in the eighth house, this is where you start to notice like the afternoon color of the sun start to change, right? It goes from like kind of that, that bright and clear to now everything kind of has a yellow orange tint to it because the sun's starting to, you know, fatal nightfall is starting to approach. So the eighth house has this like gates of the underworld, like kind of this beginning, this, this beginning of the end kind of a feel to it, which is, you know, just, just super warm and cuddly and exactly what you would want a house to represent. Oh my gosh. You just said so much. <laughs> it was so illuminating already. It's fun. I'm, I'm kind of using that word on purpose. Yeah. I was like, what an ironic word to use for the eighth house. Like, <laughs> you're illuminating this dark house, but I love that the connotation of dark, it, it's, it's literal. It's because yeah, absolutely because it doesn't have a strong aspect to the ascendant, which is where the sun, the, where the the point of light in the yeah, chart where light breaks through. Okay, so you mentioned I, th I thought it was three other houses or two other houses that are considered dark houses. Which ones are they? There were three of them: the second house, the sixth house, and the twelfth house are the other what are called dark houses. Okay, and you said they represent subjectively negative experiences, right? And do you mean by that, like when we're having them, they don't feel super fun and comfortable? Usually. That, yeah? Yeah. And so if you have planets in the eighth house, does that mean you're going to have a lot of these subjective, subjectively negative experiences? Or does it just mean that you're, you're going to be good at actually handling some adversity? Or, or how would you interpret that? Yeah, it can be a little bit of both. So generally when people have like 
connections with the eighth house. It can be, uh, it, it will depend a little bit on the planet involved, of course, but more the, the more difficult planets tend to be sources of anxiety or conflict within an individual. Whereas benefic planets, those, those more helpful planets can actually serve as shields or barriers to these experiences and kind of help us navigate those more easily or even be in positions to help other people navigate those situations more easily. So it's sort of one of those things where it's like, if you have planets in the eighth house or, you know, like in any of the dark houses really that are kind of like able to handle themselves, then you, then you can use that as a way to support other people who are maybe going through more difficult times. So you might see this like in individuals who are like crisis counselors or even like emergency room doctors or things like that. So it can, it can be a bit of both. Obviously, we all love it when we get to be the, the person that helps other people through crisis. But the unfortunate part of life is that there will be times when we are ourselves in crisis mm -hmm. for various situations. And so the eighth house can help us kind of see what those are, when those are, and how, what our immediate response to those tend to be to help us kind of be a little bit more insightful about how we manage those events, what our immediate reactions are and be like, oh, that might not be actually the best way. My, my default reaction might not actually be the best one and can help you kind of give insight into that before, before that happens. And can, for people that don't know what the malefics and the benefics sure. are, can you just like list, these are male malefics and these are benefics and this is what it might yeah. mean if you have any of these. Yeah. Yeah. So typically all things being equal, which is never the case, Saturn and Mars tend to be more on the malefic side, Mercury kind of a little bit towards that. And then everybody else tends to be more helpful, but I'm going to make it more complicated because it can also depend on who is ruling what house in your chart. So like if you have Jupiter in the eighth house and you're like, oh, yes, excellent. Uh, if Jupiter rules the 12th house in your chart, then that might be, that's more of a damper on that because Jupiter itself will rule like a, a, a more difficult house while also being in a difficult house, which can sometimes compound that. Okay, break that down for yes. us a little bit slowly. Yeah, just, sure. just repeat that, but like a little bit more slow if someone's trying to look at their chart and follow sure. along with what you're saying. Uh, so even though benefic planets like Jupiter, Venus, the sun tend to be more helpful or provide us with those skills or insight to maneuver some of these more difficult occasions of the eighth house, if those planets are also themselves signifying a, a difficult area of the chart, then that might not be such a great combination. It rules the 12th house if it rules the sixth house or if it, yeah, we'll just keep it there. <laughs> no, 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 that's helpful because we, as we've been going along this series, we've been talking a lot about rulership and house rulers. And we actually created a free guide to help people figure out how to figure out what rules what mm. in their chart. So you, go, you can go to astrologyhub.com slash ruler if you don't know which planet rules your eighth house and then how to then find where that where else that's showing up in your chart and then start to piece that together to create a story Perfect. right yes okay again that's astrologyhub.com slash ruler and that's free and available for anybody that's watching this house series okay so we're talking about some of the things that aren't super fun <laughs> Let's get specific is this like can the, for example a question that comes up a lot it, can the eighth house predict death is it about money? We always hear it's about death, taxes, money, mm -hmm. sex. It's like, wait, first of all, how do all these things go together? Yeah. And well, is that true? Yes and no. So the big things for the eighth house for me are anxiety, fear, death, and other people's money. Anxiety, fear, and death are all kind of related thematically in the eighth house being where we're kind of leaning back into that dark house aspect. So it's like things that are not super great for life, experiences that we as humans don't want to deal with. Obviously, if we could go throughout life without fear and anxiety, what a great world that would be. But, you know, it's just a part of life. It's a part of nature, unfortunately. And we have to find ways to maneuver it. So they're all related in that, that dark aspect of it. And also the, the sort of astronomical happenstance that when the sun is in the eighth house, it's declining. So it's kind of like this kind of this solar journey thing that happens with the houses to where the sun is born on the ascendant, where it rises into this world and it sort of fades away and passes away as it sets on the descendant to go do its like underworld journey before the cycle just keeps going. And so the eighth house kind of represents that that old age withering away, passing away kind of thing. 
So all three of those, anxiety, death, and fear, are kind of related to that. The other people's money, which is sort of like the weird sore thumb sticking out in this otherwise very thematically consistent package, comes from what is referred to as derived houses. And derived houses are a secondary interpretive system where houses take on meanings based on their relationship to other houses. Okay, so that's a lot of words. But when it comes to the eighth house, all this really means is that the seventh house represents other people, your partner, you know, your spouse, business partners, their people just in the world generally. And since the eighth house is the second house when counted from the seventh, it has some signification of other people's money, money out there that does not belong to you. So that's where that comes from. And you can do that with all the other houses. They'll all have kind of some fun thing. One of my favorite jokes in astrology is that the first house would be the 12th house from the second. And I just think that's really funny because like a super basic interpretation is like, I am my money's worst enemy, which is true. <laughs> I feel like that's true for a lot of people. So that's like one of my favorite little like baked in jokes for that. But derived houses, it's a, it's like a, it's a bit more of like an advanced thing. I wouldn't super worry about it. I hardly really ever use them myself professionally, but in some instances that is an interpretive thing that gets baked into it. Well, what I love about it, even if you don't understand what it is, is it helps you understand the why. Like there, yes. there's an actual, there's an, a right. logical explanation for why we just throw in other people's money. Right, right, right. It's house. like, mm, what else can we throw in here? Let's <laughs> <laughs> Let's just throw that in. So actually, I realized that we kind of forgot to answer like the mm. main question, I guess, of our previous question, which okay. was, well, maybe it wasn't the main question, but it was like the first part of it was, can death be predicted through the eighth house? Oh, yeah, yeah, was yeah. one of the things. Definitely um, got to come back to that. Don't yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, and so my answer to this is it's a little bit complicated. It's a yes and no kind of a thing. Typically, no. And by that, I mean, like, if you're just looking through your chart and you're just like looking at transits through eighth house stuff and you're like, oh, gosh, eighth house, am I going to die? The answer is almost always no. Like, no, you're not. There are in in... In the tradition, there is this whole other set of things that has to happen first before we even pull that in. So there are kind of like much more complicated and technically involved length of life techniques that don't even really involve the eighth house at all. They're just like something else happening in the background. And the eighth house, like transits to the eighth house, probably aren't going to mess with that at all for anybody. So my answer to that is no. However, if you are working for those astrologers or astrology enthusiasts who are interested in exploring astrology more through like horary astrology, like answering questions or are interested in pursuing like medical astrology through like a specialized technique referred to as decumbiture, because those charts exist a little bit separately and they don't have this kind of like more fully involved length of life stuff behind them, eighth house stuff in those charts can be much more serious than mm. they would be in just like a normal transit, like for you and I just right now kind of a thing. So mm. that's my complicated answer to that very, okay. yes, that, to that, that seemingly very easy question. Well, you know, it's funny because I've, I do a lot of, it's called The Cosmic Connection, another show on our podcast with Rick Levine. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've covered this death topic quite a bit. And he said, you know, ironically, there's usually Jupiter is is oftentimes involved in someone's death chart, meaning, and, and, and one way to look at that would be that for the person transitioning, it's actually a, it, it is a liberation. Like sure. it is an expansion and it's yeah, right. really more for the people that are left behind that it can be maybe one of these very you know, yeah. life experiences that you're talking about. Yeah, As they say, death is hardest on the living. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Okay. So aside from death specifically, mm -hmm. when someone's having significant transits to the eighth house, what kinds of things might be coming up for them? Yeah. Unfortunately, nothing super fun is what we can normally expect from eighth house things. Usually, like I said, eighth house will have kind of those big three things, death, anxiety, fear kind of stuff. So like big transits or big activations to the eighth house can kind of force people to confront or deal with topics or situations that they feel anxious on. Like speaking personally, when I had my I ended up suffering through like a very prolonged kind of struggle with an anxiety disorder after my most recent eighth house perfection year after my solar return. So this kind of like big, one of those key things that you worry about with eighth house years is like, oh, I'm going to have to deal with some something scary 
And it's mm-hmm. like, yes, everything, absolutely everything. And that's not something that hopefully most people will experience. But based on like my own kind of roll of the dice, we'll say that astrology gave me when I came into this world, one of the ways that it manifested was a, a, a couple of years struggle with an anxiety disorder. Um, and that's a pretty like uh, that's just like it's one of those things where it's like, oh, that's on the nose. Thanks. Textbook, <laughs> right. Right, right, right. Yeah. right. Yes. It's like, well, yeah. I guess there's a reason why it's in the list. When I had a activation to my eighth house, that was when I was going through a serious divorce. Right. And yeah. also financial like yeah. serious challenges, you know, yeah. dig myself out of debt and, you know, yeah. a lot of things like that. So, I, I mean, I can understand what you're saying. And I remember when I was going through it, I, I met with several different astrologers. Because the first one told me that I was probably going through a divorce because I, I didn't know for sure yet what was happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I had to go to two more to make sure that it was actually true. And all of them, <laughs> they, they were saying the same thing. I'm like, no, I don't no, no. want to hear. But all of them also said that when you get through the other side of this, you will be stronger than ever. Like you will be more fortified in who you are as an individual. Mm-hmm. There's a power and a strength that lies for you on the other side of this. Would you say that that is also true about eighth house transits, that something is being kind of dredged up from inside of you that could be your greatest asset? Sometimes, yes. I think it depends a lot on how, a little bit at how, I guess, lucky you are in being able to access various resources to Hmm. handle whatever is coming up. And that's not something that everybody has. Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to have like supportive family and to kind of have my own like meditative practice and things like that, that helped me kind of pull through my own anxiety issues. Um, It's something that I kind of still struggle with. It's not at all as bad as it used to be. Whether that's made me stronger, I'm about to say no. (laughs) I definitely could have done without having to, you know, deal with the with the anxiety for the past while that could have been super fun because one thing that i think we get into some trouble with sometimes in astrology is sort of like glamorizing or romanticizing suffering by promising Mm -hmm. people that they'll be better at the end of it because sometimes Mm -hmm. they're just not like sometimes you just go through sometimes you just go through hell to be in hell and there's not really like a big cosmic lesson at the end of it it's Mm -hmm. just um, it's just that's just how it had to be unfortunately uh, so that's something that I think that we as astrologers can probably get a little bit better at talking people about, but also like being there for them if we can serve in that capacity to like be a sounding board or like to help them go to like, OK, like therapy is something you really need to look into and kind of be that. You know, if you're if you're an astrologer who does not have a background in like counseling or counseling or <laughs> counseling, counseling or or therapy to be like, no, you actually should look into somebody like this because it seemed this could be very helpful for you. Um, so being able to have those resources and be in contact with the people or whatever to help you develop those skills that you can use outside of the immediate like eighth house crisis probably can make you a much more prepared person for the world outside. But I do think a lot of it is about being able to access those resources. Mm. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that. I, well, astrology came into my life during that yeah, time. Yeah, and astrology if, can absolutely be one of those resources. Absolutely. It became the resource that I... <laughs> on so hard. It's why I am so happy to share it with the world because it's like, God, this can really be a resource that helps you through very, very, very challenging times. Mm. Uh, and the fact that those astrologers said that to me, I don't know if it, if they could actually see that in the chart. Yeah. They were telling me something that was really, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was the most helpful thing for me. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Yeah. I actually got to just decide that that was going to be true because yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, 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 it was, it, I, it's kind of hard to know which one precedes the other. Was it written that way or was it that it was reinforced for me and I just decided to believe it and then it became that way? Who knows, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But like I said, you know, having even just having somebody in your corner. Yes. To be like, you can do this. Like this isn't going to be this isn't going to defeat you can be super helpful. But again, not something that everybody has, unfortunately. Right. And everybody doesn't have someone in their corner for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Tell us about the eighth house and money. We've talked about other people's What does that actually mean? Does that mean it's going to help you find money? Does that mean other people are going to just give you money? Like, what does it actually mean? Yeah, it can. Usually. So another thing that comes up a lot in eighth house stuff, well, maybe not a lot, is it can be instances where you receive large amounts of money. One thing that we cannot really move beyond the eighth house is its kind of core message of of loss in some way. So the eighth house, so so we kind of have this axis. We have the second house, which is like my stuff, right? 
And then we have the eighth house, which is like somebody else's stuff, which is like definitively not my stuff. And so when we see these like second eighth house balances, one thing that we have to remember is that the eighth house can often represents something to where like somebody else has this thing because I do not have this thing, right? Like just basic definitions. If it's mine, it's not yours, right? So what usually ends up happening is that for for money, of course, to come to us from the eighth house, it has to it has to come through this. It's no longer somebody else's money. And I bring, I say all this to say that a lot of times when eighth house money stuff gets activated, it tends to come through inheritance type things. So it's like, it's no longer this other person's money because they're not here anymore. And now I have it. And now I might have to deal with loss, you know, in like a different, it's like, cool, I have this, I have this thing, but I may have lost this other person in my life uh, in order to get this thing. So there's this kind of like teeter totter kind of balance aspect with the eighth house that we normally have a very difficult time getting away from. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of the kind of challenging things about the eighth house. From your perspective as an astrologer, is there anything that would be subjectively positive about the eighth house? Anything Um, beneficial? Yeah, I mean, it's a hard one. I guess getting money from, I guess getting money is generally a subjectively positive thing, but it's just one of those things where the eighth house has so much kind of so much kind of subjectively difficult stuff on it that it's hard to pull out something that is like a supremely positive that is just like a glowingly positive thing i have seen a lot of people who are who have like strong eighth house placements kind of like i talked about before be able to be you know like crisis counselors emergency room doctors people who can be there to get people through and i would say that that is a really powerfully helpful, powerfully positive manifestation of the eighth house. But again, it's one of those, it's like, oh, cool. I can help all these people through whatever they're, they're going through, but wouldn't it just be super awesome if they just like weren't going through this at all to begin with? So it's, it's kind of like that. It's that give and take aspect of the eighth house. Yeah. I mean, what I'm hearing from you is they have an an unusual ability to stay cool through adversity and Mm -hmm. crisis. That they're like, keep their heads. They're not going to necessarily lose, lose themselves in those times because they're, I, I know that we talked about being resourced externally yeah. before, but mm-hmm. I, I would guess that these people have access to a, a pretty deep well, a deep reservoir of resource within them. If they're able, again, like you said, meditation mm-hmm. or, you know, if, if they yeah. have tools and things that they're using to get there, yeah. it feels like they would probably be able to get there even more easily than someone who doesn't have that that kind of placement or, right. or that emphasis in their chart. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's just- No, it's I, fine. It's no, like no. I have people in my life that, you know, maybe they have a lot, a lot like their life is not easy. Right. Like it's sort of like a string of really challenging events. And they're the ones that, like they can actually handle the the hard things. They 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 weren't they they haven't gone through life on a silver spoon, mm-hmm. and they're actually able to really like. Wait, does that make sense? Go through. Yeah, no. Well, I'm, I I, I knew what you meant. In their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what you meant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, there is sort of that aspect. You know, it, it's that again, kind of that give and take kind of aspect of the eighth house. In that, unfortunately, the people who kind of come as those individuals who can be sources of strength or comfort or resource to other people often themselves went through something very, very difficult. Yeah. And so they've been able to kind of take that and turn it into something. But it's like, cool, but they still had to like go through that really yeah. kind of challenging period to come out of it as oh, something yeah. like much more. So it's like we've, I don't sort of like transmuted the trauma into yeah. something much more helpful, which can be awesome. But it's like, man, why did I like, why did I have to go through like this? The good thing, I guess, is with you kind of continuing on that, that kind of statement, I guess, that a lot of people who are able to kind of access this or have these, like this emphasis with the eighth house, but t- that tends to be more positive, is that they can be really good, like cycle breakers mm-hmm. themselves. Like, you know, wow. those people who have those, like uh, my parent, you know, it, they like having that kind of reflection of being like, my parenting was like this. I didn't like it. So I'm not going to do that to my kids. You know what yes. I mean? Like that yes. kind of a thing. That's yeah, 
I, I get what you're saying. It's like none of these experiences we would ever wish for ourselves or wish for anybody else, you know, right. have a, a horrible childhood or be abused as a child or any of us. Right. It's not like, right. oh, well, it's worth it to, yeah, to be totally. able to then help other people. It's like, like no, well, it's not. I don't know. You know, I, and, and who would I be to say that to you? Right. However, I see what you're saying. It's it's this give and take, this you're you're losing something in order to gain something or gain so you're gaining something and losing something at the same time yeah. and it really i keep seeing this horizon line yeah exactly. and how it's like the sun is going away so you're losing the light but you're getting the dark can yeah. you is can are there use that of, <laughs> yeah. yeah like yes exactly yeah okay really yeah good. and like the best thing that you can hope for with the eighth house is that whatever whatever like the negative part of it is like whatever the loss of it is is something that you ultimately didn't really care about Mm. to get something that you ultimately do care about at the end of it. And sometimes we're not always able to make those negotiations. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So, but it can be one of those things that can be, that that can be used that way. It's just, mm. we don't always get to pick, unfortunately. Right. Okay. Question for you about the occult and eighth house being re related to the occult. First of all, what is the occult? And second of all, do, is the second, is the eighth house actually related to it? Yeah. So what is the occult? Well, that is a philosophical question I was not anticipating. So the word occult just means like that which is hidden. And so that's kind of an interesting thing to look at, like through the lens of the eighth house, which is a house which has a lot of like hidden things to it, like things that we don't necessarily want to talk about, things that we kind of stuff away to the side. So in some regard, I do think the eighth house does have, it has like an occult connection kind of on like a definitive kind of a level. I have never been very comfortable with the idea of like, occult type topics being associated with the eighth house. I think that's much more like a ninth house kind of a thing. The ninth house being a place where we go to like expand ourselves, like be open to things like spirituality, where we seek advice from, you know, whatever higher power it is that you subscribe to or that you follow. That's not really something that I see a lot in the eighth house. The eighth house isn't really a place I would go to for like spiritual upliftment. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like that's not, yeah. it's not super fun. Yeah. Uh, but it's interesting that, that it follows that the one that would be more about spiritual upliftment follows the eighth house. Sure. You know? Yeah. Just um, in terms of the, the journey or the trajectory of going through the houses in a continuous way, mm -hmm. you know, one leading to the next. It, it's just an interesting observation. So yeah, when it comes to like those kind of like spiritually oriented kind of occult things, I'm not sure the eighth house is a super great fit for it, but it is interesting to see in like other contexts how situations involving the eighth house can themselves be occult and that it's like hidden stuff things that aren't like things that aren't super easy to see and so like from a more like physical medical astrology kind of standpoint stuff in the eighth house can be like illnesses or injuries that are hidden that take a little bit more kind of digging to find so there is definitely some some crossover there for the eighth house and the occult but um, i guess it, i guess it depends a little bit on how one exactly describes or maybe like themselves experiences like what one defines as like a cult type subjects and right that's not something i can like personally like prescribe to people you know could it be like otherworldly type things or like beyond the veil type things like near-death experiences mm -hmm. or experiences with you know people who have died or you know are are beyond the veil yeah, or quote um, unquote hidden sure 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 I would, I would think so, yes, because I also will see eighth house stuff in individuals who work within the hospice care industry. So nice. I don't think, I don't think it's too much of a jump to go from that to like a little bit more of a less physical kind of interaction with the, with, with, the, with those who have passed. Right. Okay. Now I've also heard in terms of the, the categories that the eighth house includes death, other people's money taxes but also sex mm -hmm. do you do you put that in in that house or is that more fifth house yeah i have never been one to ascribe sex to the eighth house where that has kind of come from is sort of a bit more of a like 20th century sort of reconfiguration i guess of the houses to where the houses and the signs of the zodiac started to kind of smash up against one another to bleed into one another with their different meanings. And that's not like historically signs of the Zodiac have kind of been over here. Houses have kind of been over here. They have their own sort of like uh, descriptive categories or like I talked about the eighth house in the beginning. It's like, it's a dark house. It's, you know, it falls into the underworld. It's a solar house. It has its own kind of combinations or descriptions of meaning that, that 
bring it out. But in like the 20th century, there was a push to kind of combine the houses and the signs together. And Scorpio, of course, is the eighth sign. It gets attached to the eighth house. Scorpio medically is associated with the genitals. And what do you do with your genitals? So that's where the sex aspect of it came from. Uh, and that's never really been something I've been super excited about just because knowing where the eight, like knowing kind of the, 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 the trajectory of the eighth house, the theme of the eighth house, I don't like combining those two things. Yeah. That sounds very scary to me. And it's just like, you know, sexual assault is already super common. Let's not, let's not, let's not play with that anymore. Mm, interesting. So what, where would you put sex then? I think the fifth house probably like, I think the fifth house probably makes a lot more sense. The fifth house is typically a house that has much more like positive, pleasurable experiences for the body specifically. And of course, the fifth house representing, you know, children, if we choose to have them, it just seems like a da, da, cause effect. <laughs> right, right, kind right. Of the situation. Yeah. What happens if you have no planets in the eighth house? Does that signify anything? Unfortunately, while some of us may be lucky enough to avoid having planets in the eighth house, that doesn't keep us completely out of the grip of the eighth house. Going back to the rulership resource that you mentioned earlier, everybody has a planet that will rule the eighth house. And so will its, its job is then to kind of take up responsibility for eighth house topics and kind of do do whatever it can with those topics based on how it's positioned in your chart, what it's up to, what it's doing. So we can never quite escape the eighth house. There will always be, you know, there will always be an eighth house ruler from which to emanate eighth house gunk into our lives. And then it's just about part of the magic of astrology is knowing where that is, knowing what that looks like and being able to like have our feelers out for when that time of for that planet being more involved in our life is coming so we can kind of get our, get everything ready for whatever kind of shake up the eighth house Lord might be trying to bring into our lives. I, I wanted to ask you that question. So when people are looking at their chart and they're looking at their transits and they're like, oh God, like I'm going into an eighth house transit or, you know, I have all this energy in my eighth house. Mm -hmm. What, what do you say to clients or people that you're working with when they're <laughs> like that? that anticipatory stance that that you know has them feeling a lot of anxiety already even yeah. before the thing even happened yeah 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 isn't that just the fun part of it though like you're, you're pre <laughs> you're pre-anxiety anxiety like i don't know what this is but i'm already afraid of it um right. yeah so one thing that helped me a lot in my like i mentioned before i went through a pretty prolonged period of time where i struggled with an anxiety disorder one of the things that helped me get through it and something that I repeat to clients, though I'm not at all licensed to be a counselor or therapist or anything like that, is just sort of like, I eventually realized that whatever sort of like nightmare scenario I invented in my head actually isn't happening yet. And so, but as long as I'm there, it is happening to me right, right now, if that made any yeah. sense. Oh, and so yeah. it's like, it's like I can choose to be there in this nightmare future that may not ever happen. Or right. I can choose to be here where it's not happened and it may never happen. And so that's something that I, that I try to pass on to people who are kind of going through that. It's like, okay, well, it's not here yet. It's good to be kind of aware that it's on the horizon because that's literally the first step of devising any sort of plan is just knowing that it's knowing that there's something happening. And then we kind of like start digging into, you know, like the symbolism of what's happening in their chart specifically and saying, okay, so these are, these are the areas where it looks like things might like this is where it looks like the impact point is going to be basically. So what are actionable things that we can do now to cover this from being a bigger problem than if we had done nothing at all? Exactly. And it goes back to what you said before, that the ability to take any of these transits and it's like turn lemons into lemonade. And I'm not yeah, saying that. I don't think you ever want the lemons in the first place. No, no. You have the lemons, may as well work with it as, as, as well as you can, right? Yeah. But what what you said is that being resourced is the first, is the most important variable and being able to do that. Right. And so it seems to me like what you just said, having the awareness and then knowing a little bit about where it might hit you <laughs> personally in your chart and then getting the resources you need yeah. even preemptively. Even just lined like, up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and I was going to ask you that too, because I've had, I've had in my own life times of like, God, do I really want to know? Like, is it better sure. to just not know? Is it better to just sort of like free fall into these things? And when I reflect on my life, I have had times where 
I didn't have astrology in my life. Mm -hmm. And I went through some really hard times. And it was super challenging. And having astrology in my life and having the foresight has helped me, again, not avoid any of the stuff mm -hmm. that's really hard, but at least feel like I have some, some like bearing through it, some like anchor in it, yeah. you know, in the storm. It's like, okay, A, you have an idea of how long it's going to last. Yeah, you. exactly. Really helpful, exactly. Right? That's what yeah. I was going to say. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. No, it's like one of my, one of my biggest points when it comes to like consultations is like harm reduction in some yeah. way. It's like, yeah. you know, you're going to go through difficult times. It's normal. Everybody does it. It sucks when it's our turn, you know? Yeah. But if we can kind of know what's going to happen before this eighth house thing starts and kind of get an idea of what's going on, then we can start reducing how much it's going to, how much of a bother it's going to be to us. And mm -hmm. even in a situation where there may be not anything that we can do necessarily, because sometimes eighth house transits only will reflect on us what's happening to somebody else, like the loss of a loved one. Like we can't right. really do anything about that. But right. we can kind of get our own self ready to go through grief. Yes. You know what I mean? So even when there's a situation where we have no control over over what's going to happen, the least, the very least that you have is a start date and an end date. And as mm -hmm. long as you can pull through to the end date, you're leagues ahead. <laughs> oh my gosh. Exactly. I remember that asking that question a million like how when is this ending? Why? When is it over? It's, it's, like, it's like little kids in the back seat. Like, are we almost are we there, there yet? <laughs> I kept asking astrologers, like, am I almost there yet? Am I almost through this? It just, it's, it, when you're in those times, it can feel just like it'll never end. But right. one of the other things that astrology shows us is that everything's always changing. Like, yeah. it, it, you, can, you won't stay in that place forever. It will shift. Yeah. So, I, and I'm, I'm speaking right now to anybody who's like actually looking at their chart or in, an eighth house is situation right now and just acknowledging that it's super challenging. There's yeah. no like, there's no sugarcoating yeah. those, those experiences. They just are really challenging. And it's interesting how when we come into this life, it's like we have a, I keep thinking of our astrology chart. It's almost like our dance card. You know, it's like you have this lineup of mm -hmm. things that there's not, there's nothing you can really do about that, but how you meet it and how you engage with it and how you work with it. That is the part that you do have some control over. Right. Yeah. 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 Ryan, this has been so much fun to talk with you is I, I'm curious, what is your favorite house in the house? Oh, in all the houses? oh, what is my favorite house? I think my favorite house is probably the sixth. The sixth house. Mm -hmm. And just give us a quick why, because we've already been there. So we, we've got I have four planets there. Yeah. And what do you like about it? I like that. <laughs> I like that it signifies like small animals and pets and that I have four planets there and I have a lot of pets. So it just feels right to me. It, it's awesome. like, yes, that checks out. <laughs> I love it. Ryan, you're going to be an inner circle astrologer with us soon. And I'm wondering if you have an idea of the mastery class that you're going to teach. What's What technique or tool are you going to teach? Yeah, it looks like, unless there's some kind of change or whatever, that I'm talking about natal temperament. Natal temperament. What's yeah. that? So natal temperament, going kind of back to my to my roots as a medieval astrologer, it's very similar to how people like talk about like having or like, well, oh, like calculate elements in their chart. Like, yeah. oh, I have so many planets and air signs and blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of like that, except for it is a categorizing or kind of summing up an individual's chart based off of one of the four classical temperaments, choleric, phlegmatic, melancholic, and sanguine. And oh. then exploring how those affect us on like personality, affect our bodies, affect how we react to things. So it's a little bit of a sort of like uh, an, an introductory uh, classical medical astrology technique that people can go in and explore for themselves, get an idea of what how their astrology lines up to their own lived experiences. Because kind of like you said, what astrology tells us is that everything changes and that and natal te inherent temperament can change over our lives while also kind of giving people a little bit more of some actionable information about how they can adjust things in their lives to match or counter whatever their kind of dominant temperament reaction style is if they are may be unhappy with how, what their natural reaction to things tends to be. Wow. Ryan, I, I, my children have gone through a lot of Waldorf education. And okay, they, yes. They use the temperament yep, in they like sure do. understanding <laughs> kids. And I didn't realize there was an astrological underpinning to that. Yep. I mean, I knew it mapped to like the elements, you know, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that there's an actual astrological technique that helps us not guess what yeah, but a, no. a child's temperament is, <laughs> but actually know. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. Amazing. 
Really looking forward to that. If any of you are interested in learning from Ryan and 12 other astrologers who are amazing, who you've been meeting as a part of this house series, you can sign up to get on the wait list for the Inner Circle. We are going to be opening up enrollment very, very soon. And you will be the first to know if you're on the wait list. You also get a free mastery class when you join the wait list. So you can go to astrologyhub.com slash IC23. That's I-C as in cat, 23. <laughs> I know that Ryan has cats, so that's, I use that on purpose. Yeah, I thought you were going to say, if you want to join Ryan in, the tw- in his 12 cats, like, oh, how'd she know? No. <laughs> 12 cats, for real? No, but no, they're, like, no. they're like outside cats that I watch that aren't like mine. You know what I mean? So oh. I guess by some bearings, I could have, but no, I don't. Oh, I love it. And, you, and you're a Leo sun and a, a Leo moon, right? Yeah. Yeah, surrounded by cats is perfect. I love it. If you want to get on the wait list now, now's the time to do it. Astrologyhub.com slash IC23. We would love to see you in the inner circle working with these astrologers, really helping to make astrology something that you can immediately apply in your life. You, you, you learn techniques every single month that you can take. You can apply them to your chart. You can actually use astrology in a very practical and tangible way. So our one of our main goals in the inner circle is to help reduce the overwhelm, reduce the noise, you know, <laughs> like make it easy for you to just focus in on one place. You know, you're going to be there every single month and you get, you know, guided through all the different energetic signatures of each month. And plus you get to get these different tools as you go through the year. So really looking forward to having you, Ryan, as an inner circle astrologer guide with us and just thank you for being here with us on the house series. It's been super fun to, to get to know you here and to introduce you to our community. Yeah, super fun to be here. Sorry, I had to meet everybody by being a doomer and talking about the <laughs> house, but yeah, hopefully it was fun. I thought this, this probably was the one house that astrologers are like, God, I hope I don't get the eighth house or, you know, of all the houses, that'd be like n- not the most fun to do. But thank you for showing up and doing it and you did a great job. <laughs> Sometimes we just need to know the truth. And it, it, it's not always, it's not always rainbows in, in unicorns. Oh, I wish so. <laughs> I love that. It's like the Leo part of you. Just like, I, I, I wish though. Why can't it? Like, just why be? can't it? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Who said? I, who said? <laughs> yeah. Can we, can we just change the code? Can we just change the design? Because we don't really all need this. Awesome. Ryan, thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being a part of this house series. We've loved sharing this content with you. And thank you for being a part of our community. Thank you, as always, for making astrology a part of your life. We'll catch you on the next episode. Stay tuned for the ninth house coming next week. Take care.